Church's Infants on Thrones. Listener Action. Listener Action. Listener Action. Welcome back to Infants on Thrones. I'm Glenn Ostland, and this is our November 2018 Listener Essay Contest, where you, the listeners, get to say what you want to say, how you want to say it, where you want to say it, and it is more than a privilege that that where gets to be here, that we get to host these on Infants on Thrones, where so many of us are all infants sitting on different kinds of thrones, right? Today's essay comes from Matthew and is titled 1984. And after you listen, please go to our website and vote for it and provide the author some personal feedback. Winners will be announced in early December. First place gets $200, second place $100, and third place $50. All right, ready, set. All right, go ahead. Me, about 12 years old, around the year 1989. I was in a dilemma. I could see no way out of this dilemma except to attempt to make myself absent from it Some way, somehow. See, I was in sacrament meeting at 12 years old, full of angst, anxiety, self-disgust, guilt, and I could see no way out in the moment. Do I take the sacrament and break my baptismal covenants because of my sins? My ugly, horrific, disgusting, self-satisfying sins that will need to be atoned for? Or do I not take the sacrament, show my humility, my contrition, my desire to be better, and thus out myself to my parents and those around me that I am not worthy to eat the pinch of bread and the tiny sip of water passing in front of me. Because that leads to questions, and questions lead to guilt and shame talks, one-on-one, with my father, in the most embarrassing and eternally shameful practices he sought out as a concerned parent for my eternal soul. You see, I experience Mormon thought crimes, egregious thought crimes of a sexual nature, a nature so taboo that they can only be compared to murder, or so I was taught as a child. I had thoughts of a sexual nature about humans of the opposite sex, and I didn't know how to control the thoughts and urges coming at me. As in George Orwell's novel 1984, sex for pleasure is outlawed, and in Mormonism, impure thoughts of a sexual nature could be considered a thought crime. I never acted on them with another. I only acted on what has been disgustingly miscategorized as self-abuse. I was the kind of kid that it took all the way until senior year of high school to actually kiss a girl that I'd been dating since sophomore year. I just couldn't control the thoughts about sex, and I desperately wanted to. I did everything I could. Yes, I even tried tying my hand to the bedpost by the advice of Apostle Mark Peterson, to no avail. So, apparently, one day the pressure was too high, and I decided I can't do what I had been doing, which was take the sacrament adding to my guilt and ultimate damnation for broken baptismal covenants. I decided to stay home on Sundays. I simply would not go. My parents pled with me, guilted me, tried punishing me, but I just would not go to church. They could take away anything I owned in this world, and it wouldn't push me to face the weekly guilt and shame sessions that were far and above anything I dreaded and feared as a child. This lasted six months. I came to this realization as I was preparing what to say for this essay. The realization that this was the reason why I had stopped going to church for a time as a child. I had forgotten, maybe blocked out, the terror and fright I felt over my sins being shouted from the rooftops in spirit prison, for I knew I was the only one with this problem, and I couldn't bear to accumulate any more broken covenants on top of my gross sins. Maybe this is what started me down the road of being what some would consider a Jack Mormon, or at least a Jack-ish Mormon, All those times relaxing in bed at home while everyone else was getting solutions to problems that are only problems because someone is selling a solution? That's not how I saw it then, of course, but maybe my mind was picking up on the fact that I had nothing to be ashamed of in the first place, and I went with that. You know, the devil's way. See, I was born and raised into a Mormon family, a very righteous and LDS-centered household. In fact, my father was a seminary teacher and institute teacher while my mother stayed home with the kids. Doctrine, gospel principles, words of the leaders, personal revelation, answers to prayers, obedience to priesthood authority, these were the gears that moved our family forward in life. I went on a mission but came home a year into my mission because my mental health stayed at the time. I later married, but to the disappointment of my family, I did not marry in the temple. I had plans to marry and go to the temple when we were ready, and that's when everything changed. I began my exit from Mormonism like so many others. 
I happened to stumble upon historical data that did not fit with all I'd been taught for 29 years up to that point, and I went down a rabbit hole of historical information that I didn't know existed. It happened while watching the PBS documentary The Mormons of All Things. I was feeling particularly guilty because of so many non-righteous decisions and my inactivity in the church, and wanted to inch my way back into activity again. I watched the part of the documentary where it talks about Joseph Smith's translation of the Book of Mormon by means of a rock and a hat. In my 29 years, even after being born into Mormonism, raised by a teacher of both church history and doctrine, I had never heard this. Not one time. I was floored, confused, and had to look this up on my own. Sure enough, he did. The same rock he used to swindle people out of money. Something inside me had thought, I wonder what else I don't know about Mormon church history. Rabbit hole, meet me. I spent literally 8 to 18 hours a day every day from August of 2007 until December of 2007, reading, researching, cross-referencing, and archiving anything I could get my hands on. The thing is, early on in this little discovery, I had already come to the conclusion that I had been swindled, but I had to find out everything I'd missed over my youth. I think my shelf breaker was the lack of Middle Eastern DNA in the Native Americans. It was so cut and dry to me. I had always been taught that scientific findings and Mormon beliefs would merge, or even that scientific consensus would bend towards that of Mormon beliefs. That little piece of missing evidence was enough for me to ask myself the big question I didn't even know I was asking at the time, a thought-provoking question for anyone in the Mormon church, which Tal Bachman later articulated perfectly. If the church wasn't true, that is, if Joseph Smith did not tell the truth about his experiences, would you want to know about it? Something changed that night, and I allowed myself to explore what's real around me. It's never been the same since. During this tumultuous, painful, and confusing time, I stumbled upon a podcast I had heard of through some online ex-Mormon forums, The Church Is Not True, led by Mike Norton and Hiram. Through their excellent and informative podcast, I was introduced to even more talking points, historical tidbits, controversial in nature, joy and irreverence, and two of my post-Mormon heroes, Bob McHugh and Tal Bachman. I devoured Bob and Tal's posts and essays. I was oscillating so heavily from pain to elation that I just needed some grounding. I found what I needed in this podcast and in Bob and Tal's words. After binge-listening and re-listening to the short-lived The Church Is Not True podcast, I happened upon Mormon Expression with John Larson. John's weekly podcast was the highlight of the week for me, always wondering what he'll bring up next and if Mike Tannehill will get verbally bloodied and bashed by reason and reality again and again. It was through Mormon Expression that I was introduced to Infants on Thrones, and I've been hooked since podcast one. I even stomached the Crystal episodes. One of the ways I have found I can deal with the anger, heartache, confusion, and helplessness that returns from time to time of what is my ex-Mormon journey is through music. I've been attempting songwriting for over 20 years now, and i found it to be one of the best ways I can focus my frustration. My first attempt at writing an ex-Mormon song was a song I had hoped my family would listen to and take note of that I wrote with my band. Well, in typical ex-Mormon fashion, I went too far and messed up what could have been a great opportunity by letting my anger and frustration get the best of me. The title of the song was Long Live the Con Man, a song about the perpetuation of the con that Joseph started by the leaders and apologists of today. You can imagine with a title like this that the message didn't go over too well. If you'd like to hear it, you can go to thepoorband.com. That's spelled the P-O-U-R band.com. Sorry for the shameless plug. My goal since has been to be more sensitive, yet strong in my convictions. So I've kept at it, and being the podcast junkie that I am, and more specifically being interested in ex-Mormon podcasts, I sometimes go back and listen to the noteworthy episodes. Not too long ago, I went back to John Larson's website and browsed his podcast to see if anything sparked my interest. I remembered the episode titled Orwell vs. Mormonism. In this episode, John shows the many parallels between a few George Orwell stories and the Mormon Church. I've always been a fan of 1984, and I wanted to use this idea to explain to those who don't understand that I do not have a choice in believing in Mormonism anymore. It just isn't possible anymore. Any more possible than believing in Scientology, the Jehovah's Witness Church, or homeopathy for that matter. I know too much now, about all of them, to even attempt to believe or practice any of them. 
Mormonism has become a dystopia in microcosm for me. Thought crimes, big brother, rewriting history, thought police, double think. It's all become quite parallel to 1984. So I can't go back to Mormonism. I made a choice that has changed me forever. That is, I want truth more than I want it to be true. I used to think that certain thoughts were crimes that needed to be tamed. But never lend intrusiveness to watch your mind gathering the blame. Like Jesus Christ.
Okay, that was great. All right, listeners, don't forget to go to our website and vote for this essay. Provide some feedback. And if you've got something you want to say and you can squeeze it in before the end of November, record your own listener essay. Send it to us. We'll post it. Come support us on Patreon. And as always, thanks for listening to Infants on Thrones. Hi. This is Hillary, Matthew, Ryan, Carol, Dutchley, and I like to play bingo online while listening to Infants on Thrones. You can comment on this episode on the website, infantsonthrones.com. If you really like what you hear, give the quorum a five-star rating and write a short review on iTunes. I did. I did. I did. Anyone for the closing prayer? Thank you for listening to Infants on Thrones. Infants on Thrones.